Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our fifth and final session of day one of the Allure Strategy Summit. We're so excited you could join us. Today's uh, last session is automating processes with RPA and chatbots. Again, my name is Jordan Future Burmeister. I'm our marketing manager, and I'm one of the moderators for the event. Just a couple quick reminders, attendees have been placed on mute. If you do have any questions or comments, feel free to submit them through either the Q&A or through the chat to panelists portal. We will spend a couple minutes at the end of the presentation uh, doing a live Q&A. Um, and just a reminder, all of the sessions from today, as well as the sessions that are going on tomorrow, will be recorded and shared about a week after the conference. And last reminder, all of the sessions for tomorrow, similar to today, do have individual links. Right after this session um, actually concludes, we will be sending out an email to all attendees with those links as well, so you can get your agenda set for tomorrow. With that, I'll hand it over to Stephen. Thank you very much, Jordan. Uh, so like Jordan said, my name is Stephen, um, and today we're going to be talking about how to automate some of your business processes uh, using some of the tools that are out there like RPA and chatbots. So I'll introduce myself briefly. Uh, we'll talk about some of the business needs that really drive automation. Um, and then we'll actually look at uh, three different tools. Um, so chatbots and RPA are going to be the main focus. Uh, but if any of you were able to catch the presentation by KTech earlier um, in the day, I did want to touch on OCR engines. Uh, so that's optical character recognition. Um, and really, it's just to close the loop uh, and make sure that we understand how all of these different technologies can fit together. Um, Finally, you know, we'll want to talk about what are the situations that best suit each tool. Uh, you know, this is a strategy summit, uh, so really what we want to be thinking about is how can we strategically apply the technologies to solve our business questions. So uh, if you've been on any of the previous sessions, you'll already have seen this slide, but I'll just speak to it very quickly. Um, you know, Alir was established in 2005, um, so we've been around for a couple of years. Uh, really, the goal of Alir is to partner with our clients. Um, and for the most part, that's been on implementation projects, integration projects, uh, ERP and HCM optimization projects. It's very much been in the software space. So uh, one of the things that we like to do is provide guidance on how to best use your software tools. Um, Specifically, I am in the management advisory services practice, um, so I work with strategic advisory services, uh, and we're focused on things like uh, application roadmaps or cloud roadmaps, uh, business process improvement, um, how do you get your end users to adopt a change more rapidly, um, you know, how do you, how do you visualize the data that's coming out of your applications, and then how do you use that to drive more strategic decision making. And of course, uh, project management. Um, again, we work on a lot of these large um, software implementation projects. It's always critical for us that they're managed well. So a little bit about myself. You can see my picture. You can also see me on the camera, I'm sure. Um, I'm a senior consultant with Alir. Um, and really with the strategic advisory services practice, I've had a unique opportunity to look at a lot of different organizations across a lot of different industries um, using a lot of different tools. Um, you know, so some of my clients are using PeopleSoft, some of them are using uh, Workday, some of them are using Oracle EBS. Um, so really I've been able to see a bunch of different uh, backdrops and how some of the tools that we're gonna talk about today apply kind of universally. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to share some of that experience and that exposure with all of you today, and you'll find that valuable. So let's get into the business drivers of automation. Um, you know, I'm sure that many of you as thought leaders within your organization are already aware of uh, a lot of these business drivers, but I think they're worth talking about um, because it's, it's always helpful to have a frame of reference for the tools themselves. So I think one key driver is this whole idea of digital transformation or digitization. Uh, and that's really to take advantage of technology. Um, and so that consists of digitizing your tasks, you know, getting processes off paper, getting them uh, into the, the digital infrastructure, onto a network, if you will. Um, that can also be integrating applications. You know, a lot of applications are a full end-to-end -end suite, um, but a lot of them are not. You know, oftentimes you have 
uh, siloed applications, siloed data. Um, and so the idea of bringing that all together into one end-to-end -end, uh, infrastructure is, is certainly powerful. Thirdly, um, one of the benefits of digital transformation is that it can actually make your processes more robust or stronger. Um, and really the driver there is that computers are better at some things than people are. Um, you know, if you think about sifting through large quantities of data, if you think about uh, sorting or filtering or categorizing, those are all things that computers are just better at than a person. And so if there's a need uh, within your organization to get to some of that data, um, to do some of those actions that computers are inherently better at, you know, digital transformation really does drive uh, this push towards automation. A second big driver in this push towards automation is the idea of pursuing cost savings. Um, and automation can be a cost reduction tool, but I do wanna spend a, a little bit of time here talking through some of the related issues. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to say that you can reduce your error rate. Um, you know, if you have a, a robot or a computer doing the work, it's always perfectly replicated every single time you do it. Um, so you, you definitely can avoid some of those fat finger mistakes, um, you know, accidentally giving your vendors 300 days to pay you instead of 30. Um, you know, anything like that can be avoided uh, if you're using um, some of these automatic or digitized solutions. Secondly, you can really reduce time spent on low value at tasks. And so I'm going to harp on this for the next hour. So you'll probably hear it a couple times. Um, but data entry is not a high value task. It's a critical task for most organizations. You know, you need the data to be in your systems and you need the data to be correct. But it's really not a high value add to actually enter the data, to sit there with an invoice in one hand and your uh, laptop in the other and to type information from you know that you're reading uh, into your ERP application. And similarly with like workflow, you know you can take a piece of paper and run it around the office and get 10 different signatures um, or you can set up the workflow rules once, click a button and use digital workflow um, to really pass that around and eliminate all the time that you have these approvals either waiting for a person or waiting for a response in the email. And thirdly, a big driver that people talk about is reducing or reallocating staff. So the idea here is that you can really elevate staff that you have um, if you can get them out of data entry and into data analysis. You know, if you have uh, staff that have a really good knowledge of your business, you know, let them spend more of their time uh, getting you the insights that you're looking for. Um, and so, you know, during the strategy summit, we had a session on Kibana uh, data analytics. Um, so hopefully you got to see that one. And if not, um, I would just recommend that you go look at the, uh, uh, the recording. But really, there's an opportunity there to elevate the kind of work that people are doing um, to be more value add, both from an organizational perspective and from a, a personal perspective, um, because you know, I think everyone can agree that sitting there typing away for eight hours a day is hardly, you know, a, a meaningful work experience. Uh, but I did want to deconstruct this idea of staff reduction a little bit. Um, I actually like to think about it in two different ways. Um, I mean, you can absolutely reduce staff. If uh, overhead cost is an issue, if you're looking to reduce your total cost, um, you know, one of the things you can do is um, reduce staff by picking up some of the work with an automated process. Uh, one of the other things you can do though, on the other hand, is augment your staff. So instead of hiring additional as your organization grows, you, know, you can still achieve a similar type of uh, growth with the support of a digital solution. So I always think that staff reduction is such a, you know, a negative approach to these kinds of technologies. Really, I think of it um, you know, as a, an opportunity to grow your business, you know, to really expand your capacity to support a broader business um, with some of these digital supporting tools. Thirdly, this is, you know, again, just another driver of you know, why people are automating in the first place. Flexibility. Um, you know, work from home in the last year has proven to be 
invaluable. Uh, you know, I live in Minnesota, so sometimes we're snowed in in the middle of a blizzard and you have to work from home. And sometimes a global pandemic will force everybody in there, you know, uh, everyone to, to start working from home, um, you know, with, with very little warning. So the ability to have digital processes, uh, online access, um, it really does make your organization better able to respond to those kind of hiccups. Uh, similarly, if you need to respond to rapidly changing legal or operational requirements, digitization is kind of key. Uh, for example, you know, there's just a change to um, allowable expenses for business meals. You know, on the one hand, if you have a very manual process for categorizing your expenses, you're going to be fighting against somebody who has years of habits of categorizing things in a certain way. If you have a digital process, however, you just change the rule, right? This category gets treated in this way. You know, it's a, a quick fix um, and it's a lot easier to respond um, to any of these kind of changes. Thirdly, uh, and this kind of goes along with what I was saying earlier, it really allows you to respond to economic pressures. Um, you know, both being able to work remote, uh, but also just expanding your ability to uh, take mass actions, I think is a, a key thing for a lot of organizations. You know, it's a, as a receiver of lots and lots and lots of emails and marketing emails and things like that, you know, you kind of, uh, you can sometimes get a bad taste in your mouth, you know, you're getting spammed. But if you look at it from the higher level, right, what those email marketing tools are really doing is multiplying the effort uh, of traditional outreach. Um, so these kind of digital tools, these automated tools, these digital processes can really be a, like a lever to, to double or triple or even a hundred times um, improve what you're doing manually anyway. So before we get into the tools themselves, which is coming up in just a couple slides, I did want to spend a minute on this idea of automation and acceleration. Because oftentimes when we think about automating processes, there's this big push uh, to, to get the process completely automated, hands off, in the background, you know, straight through processing. Um, and I would actually challenge that idea. I think that uh, in a lot of cases, process acceleration is easier to achieve, um, and it still provides a ton of business value. Um, and so what I see as acceleration is where you're using technology to enhance a process, to speed it along, but you're still going to have a human operator doing something. You know, maybe that's a key decision that the human needs to do. Maybe you have an automated process prepare data and the human uh, approves it, you know, whatever it might be. There's still a lot of value in accelerating a process, even if you don't get complete end-to-end -end automation. Um, and so that's kind of the, the approach that I think you may have heard if you were on one of the earlier sessions uh, that KTEC takes as well. Um, you know, they were specifically talking about uh, accounts payable automation, um, and their goal is to get to 80 or 90% um, automated, but to intentionally leave 10 to 20% of the process not automated so that you can still have real checkpoints, uh, you can still have real meaningful interaction, um, and that you still have uh, oversight into the process itself. Um, so there you're getting acceleration, you're still getting the value out of whatever these tools are offering, uh, even if you're not getting full end-to-end -end behind the scenes computerized processing. Uh, the other thing to consider is that not every task can be fully automated. Um, you know, it's uh, nice to think that everything could be digitized, that everything could be automated and scripted. Many things can't. Um, and in those situations, I don't think it's valuable to completely throw the baby out with bathwater. You know, you want to make sure that you're using some of these tools and technologies even to accelerate the slow parts um, of a process that's going to have a human operator. So that uh, kind of takes us through our context, you know, our background. So let's talk a little bit about some of these tools. And the first one's going to be chatbots. So, you know, what is a chatbot? It's a programmed utility. It's conducting a natural language conversation with a user. I think that part's critical. And it's really there to provide information or execute a task. So the reason I called out with a user 
uh, is because that starts to inform when can you use your chatbot, right? It needs to be uh, for a user-centric process. Um, and that's really the, the strength of the chatbot. You have this natural language interface. Um, people can ask questions and it can kind of parse out what you mean. Um, the, the other thing that the chatbots can do is to actually automate some simple requests. So if you think about the case of like a password reset, you know, if you, the end user, can work with the chatbot exclusively and you have a, a totally routine transaction, you can get it completely automated, you know, outside of the hands of, you know, like a support staff. One of the weaknesses, though, of chatbots uh, is kind of from the development side. It's that there's limited scope um, for what the chatbot can actually accomplish. Um, you know, if I think all of you have been on a phone tree where, you know, you can either listen to eight different options or press zero for a customer service rep. And, you know, sometimes that just is the easier way to do it. If all you need to do is check your balance, great. The chatbot can help you with that. If you actually have a unique situation, the chatbot's not going to be able to you know, automate everything. But again, that gets back to the point, you can still accelerate a lot of your processes without you know, expecting full automation. You know, Augment your staff, take some of the routine work off your staff's hands, um, and I think it's better for everyone overall. Uh, and then from a development perspective, each chatbot skill is kind of a separate development effort. So if you have a platform that you're developing your chatbot in and you want it to do five different things, um, you know, one might be searching a database, one might be uh, doing something in the back end, an API call or, or interacting with some other application. Each of those skills is its own development effort. So you do have to kind of build it piece by piece by piece to get a very robust chatbot. So let's look at the overview. Um, and again, you have these components. You have the natural language processing engine that sits kind of on the top. That's your user interface, right? And like I made reference to, that's determining intent. Uh, so it's parsing out, I would like to see X, Y, Z. It's picking up those keywords and it's uh, determining what you're actually trying to do. Uh, at a lower level is then the programmed conversation. After you've parsed out intent, uh, then the chatbot has a structured conversation that's been previously programmed that can really get clarifying information. It can get additional data filters. Um, it can request user information, uh, but you've provided it with what do you want to do? And now it's getting the details. And then underneath that programmed conversation, after all of the details have been gathered up front, that's really where the chatbot is performing this backend resource call. Um, so that might be querying a database, that might be calling an API, that might be interacting to, you know, to reset your password or whatever it is in your underlying application. Um, and that happens uh, very much outside of the view of the end user, but it is something to bear in mind uh, if you are looking to deploy chatbots within your organization, is that you need to have these three pieces working in concert. Uh, and like I had mentioned, you know, each different conversation is its own, um, it's its own skill. So each one needs to be developed. Um, the backend resource call might be totally distinct. Um, so it's worth taking an iterative approach with a lot of these and building them kind of conversation by conversation, use case by use case. So let's talk about some of those use cases. Um, you know, it it can act as both an accelerator or true automation. Um, in an acceleration perspective, uh, it can make it easier to access information. Uh, it can make it easy to access um, a, a website in general. Um, you know, so we're actually going to look at an example uh, in just a minute of a chatbot that helps with a complex data search. You know, if you have a casual user and you have a complex uh, database, it can be helpful to have a chatbot navigate the user directly uh, to perform complex searches to sort through that data so the casual user is not lost. Um, similar sort of thing with a payment status. You know, if you just need to find payment status, if you have an invoice number, you know, it can do that search for you. Meanwhile, on the automation perspective, um, it can really be a, an effective frontline in user support. You know, it can answer 
quick questions. It can direct people to an FAQ page that's already been set up on a website. Uh, password reset, I think I referenced earlier. You know, it's a great example of something that if it's a routine password reset, you don't need a human operator to do it anymore. Save your operators for the true complex scenarios. So we're gonna look here at a chatbot that um, O'Lear developed for one of our clients actually. Um, and so a few little pieces of background information before we uh, check it out. The chatbot here is for um, a human resources application. Um, and so we're gonna look at a recruiting application, looking at candidate data. Um, and this was built with the Oracle Digital Assistant platform. You know, there are other chatbot platforms out there. Um, you know, this is just kind of one example. Uh, the last thing to reference before we look at the video itself, um, we do have some client data in here that's been uh, edited out. So you'll notice a little gray screen uh, just in the bottom right corner. Um, but if you watch closely, you'll see that as we click into the results from the chatbot, um, it, it works just like it normally does. So let's take a look. Hello everyone, my name is Joey and today I'll be showing you how you can use Oracle Digital Assistant to filter and search requisitions. Um, so to get started, I'll show you the traditional way of performing one of these searches, just so you can compare it to what we'll be doing with ODA. Um, so if I'm in the recruiting module here, I came to the hiring tile, uh, normally it would look like this. So you can oh, sorry. Um, click show filters to add any filters to your search. Maybe you want to uh, uh, control the hiring manager you search on or what phase the requisition is in. Um, and then you can even delete the different filters you've added here as well. Once you've had those uh, and you add your keywords, you can hit search and get your results here um, and then go interact with them that way. So that's an option, but let's say you wanted to use Oracle Digital Assistant. So if I click the chat bubble here, um, you'll see I've actually interacted with this, uh, with the Digital Assistant earlier, so I have some history, but normally what'll happen is if you're opening it for the first time, um, it'll greet you, say, hello, I'm here to help. Um, I'm logged in as Rhonda, so it'll say, hi, Rhonda, I'm your hiring Digital Assistant, um, and then it'll offer you a couple of different search options. So for our demo today, we're going to do a requisition search. And it'll offer us the different attributes we can search by. So just like the different filters we have here, you'll see recruiting type, hiring manager, those sort of things. Um, so for our search, why don't we do a recruiting type search? Um, and then it'll give us the different types of recruiting types. So uh, we'll select event. And then you'll see that it's added that here. So I'll search for requisitions in the event recruiting type. Um, and then I can, I can begin the search there, I can hit start search now, or I can continue to add search conditions. So why don't we do, uh, uh, why don't we also do um, uh, a state, and then we'll do a posted state. So now you'll see that I have a requisition search that includes uh, requisitions in the posted state and in the event recruiting type. Um, let's say I accidentally clicked one of these, let's say I did, uh, uh, I don't know, a phase. Oops, I didn't mean to add a phase. I can click skip this and it'll still uh, have my original um, search conditions without um, what I misclicked on. So let's start the search there. And so the, the digital assistant will gather those results, give them to us, and then um, I can actually click on one of these just like uh, if I had done the search traditionally. And my result will open up, that, that requisition will open up in a new window. And I can interact with it as if I'd gone through the traditional module. So uh, uh, just like the usual requisition, um, uh, uh, interface, you can uh, interact with the details, you can go look at the job formatting, the posting, interviews, whatever you like. So that was already pretty fast, just going click by click, but to speed this up even more, let's say I know exactly what I want to search for and I don't want to, you know, search through the different attributes and click what I'd like from there. Um, I can do that, uh, let's say, let's use our previous search as an example. I can type out the entire search uh, on one line. So search for requisitions with an event recruiting type and a posted state. So the digital assistant has gathered all that, search for requisitions in the posted state and in the event recruiting type. So just like our previous search. And again, we're offered more search conditions if we like, um, but for, we'll just start the search now just to show you it works and we get those same results. And to speed this up even further, let's say you didn't feel like typing today for whatever reason. Um, once you've enabled voice recognition with your digital assistant, you can speak out your request to uh, the, the DA. So um, just to show you it works. 
search requisitions with an event recruiting type and a posted state. And you'll see here, uh, it's typed out the message for me and all I have to do is hit send or enter. Um, and we have our exact same search here. So, and just to show you again that it works, I can click start search now. And we have the same results here. So yeah, uh, you know, this is a really fast way to perform these searches. Um, the idea isn't that the digital assistant outright replaces your traditional searches. Uh, it's just another tool to, um, you know, give you more options to work with. So that's everything I had. Uh, thank you for watching. I hope this helps. Bye. So as, uh, as Joey showed us there, um, I do want to break down kind of what we just saw. So right away in the beginning, um, we saw you know, that there were two different skills, which is what we had just talked about. There were search requisitions and search candidates. And so each of them has a different underlying data source um, because the requisition tables are different than the candidate tables. Um, and so there is a different query. Uh, there's a different processing rule. So each skill does uh, get developed kind of independently. And you do want to stack them together or add them together to make a really robust tool. Uh, then we saw kind of the natural language processing engine, right? Um, Joey showed both kind of the traditional clicking through the options uh, and also showed, you know, typing in what you were looking for. Um, and additionally, you know, we saw that speech, that speech to text uh, as kind of an added layer um, if you really want to take it you know, to the next level. Um, but again, speech to text, text to the natural language processing engine to determine intent, and then from intent, performing that backend resource call to the, the underlying database. You know, and then we saw that program conversation, right? Adding the additional criteria. What are the additional filters you're looking for? Um, you know, we kind of saw that in action. And then finally, you're ending up with a, an actionable piece of material, right? You can directly navigate to your source transactional pages. You know, when he clicked the link that was um, over there on the right, opened up a new window directly to that particular requisition. So like he said, not uh, replacing the search feature entirely. Um, but again, if we think about like a casual user, a hiring manager who's looking for something specific, um, you know, the use cases are, are definitely there to use a chatbot as opposed to navigating through the traditional options. So that's chatbots on the one hand. Um, and so the, the other thing that we really wanted to focus on today was RPA or robotic process automation. So, you know, what's RPA? Uh, it's a program that's emulating a user to execute some kind of task. Excuse me. So really the RPA tool is interacting with your other applications for the most part through a desktop interface. You know, it's pretending to be a user. It's taking scripted actions uh, through clicks, through keyboard input, inputs, you know, through, through data that's on the screen. Um, one of the strengths of RPA is that you can kind of start with this graphical programming interface. Um, and the idea there is that you don't need to be a true developer to develop a simple bot. Um, and I can actually attest to that. I've written a couple bots myself. I am not a technical consultant. I'm a strategy consultant. Um, I will say that one of the, uh, one of the, it's not necessarily a weakness, but one of the considerations is that you can start with, you know, a, a casual user making very simple bots, but if you do want to build very robust bots, you're probably going to end up, uh, needing a developer. Um, you're going to need someone to expand on the logic, uh, within your simple bots. You're going to want to build a bot center of excellence, um, you know, you're going to need somebody who really knows these uh, RPA tools inside and out. So just a, a caution uh, from personal experience that, you know, you can make some simple bots very quickly and very easily, but to make enterprise grade bots, you know, you may end up just needing bot developers. Uh, one of the other strengths of RPA though, uh, is that it can be application agnostic. Um, you know, you don't need to uh, script anything in a particular language um, because it's emulating a user. If the user can access Microsoft Excel plus an ERP application plus uh, the internet, you know, those three things together are all accessible to the bot as well because it's emulating, um, you know, their actions. Uh, additionally, there is the potential for straight through processing with the bot. 
So that's that's kind of the full automation, you know, gold standard, right? Uh, a file comes in somewhere, uh, the bot recognizes that as a trigger, it opens the file, parses out data, enters a transaction in your ERP, uh, click save, and that's done entirely without, you know, a user. Um, and that that's a very real possibility. Uh, that's something that one of my clients is actually using bots for is uh, simple journal entries. They get the same uh, source data every single month. It's just the values in the month that change. The bot is there to parse out the data to perform a journal entry. And they actually stop it uh, because they want full control. Um, and so they have the journal entry prepared and then they require um, you know, a user to get eyes on to validate and post. Um, one of the weaknesses here of these RPA bots is that if your task is complex, if you have a lot of exceptions, if you have a lot of variations, if there's a lot of questions, you're very quickly going to make the bot extremely complex. You know, you'll need um, you'll need to program every possible combination or permutation of these exceptions, uh, and that's really one of the the key things when considering the best place to apply RPA technology is, you know, is this rule based? Are there exceptions? You know, a few exceptions, a lot of these bot tools can handle. A lot of exceptions, a lot of variability, it's probably less and less worth your time to, um, to build out every single exception you know, in programming. So let's think about the structure. Um, so typically with these RPA tools, there's what's called an orchestrator application, uh, which is kind of the command and control module. So that's sitting on a server um, or it's sitting on uh, some administrator's machine and it really coordinates all of your individual level bots. Um, your individual bot is usually just carrying out a single task. Um, similar to the chat bots where you have different skills, here each bot would be its own thing, um, and then it would be uh, executed you know, by the, the higher level orchestrator. Uh, like I made reference to a moment ago, you can either run the bots on schedule or in response to a trigger. So that might be, you know, file appears in um, a network area. Uh, that might be email comes in. Um, you know, whatever uh, digital action precedes the bot, you know, a lot of those can be triggers to then kick off um, these scripted steps. Uh, you have the bots that are programmed using the, the platform, uh, this kind of graphical interface. Um, and like I said, it starts as a graphical scripting tool, um, and then you really do have a lot more development options kind of behind the scenes. So you can do a simple one, you can kind of make a, a simple flow, um, but then if you need uh, to define variables and you need to define logic, um, if you need to define your business rules, then it really does um, usually require uh, some development knowledge. Uh, the bot carries out the exact script that you've, that you've coded, um, and then again, you know, the interaction with most applications is emulating the user. So mouse clicks, retrieving data from the current screen, um, entering data, either values or uh, data that's been captured previously from, uh, from the bot. So let's think a little bit about the use cases of, you know, these RPA bots as opposed to like chatbots. Uh, one of the big things is automating high volume transactions. Um, you know, copying form data from one application to another. Um, the, the more rule-based and the fewer exceptions and the higher volume the transactions are, the, the more and more likely it is that a bot will provide substantial value. You know, those are really the transactions that you wanna get out of a person's hand um, and kind of into a machine's hand. I have that note there about pseudo integrations. Um, you know, sometimes it can be cost prohibitive to build a true custom integration between two applications. Uh, and a bot is kind of a, an easy workaround. Um, you know, if you would have normally have a user looking at data in one application and copying it forward into a secondary application, but you can't quite um, make the cost benefit work out for building a true integration between them, a bot's kind of a, a helpful middle ground um, because it's still emulating the user experience. You don't need a full-fledged integration um, but it also automates a lot of that work. Uh, another good use for a bot, periodic tasks. So you can run them on a schedule. So anything that's happening nightly, monthly, 
Um, you know, I had a client who was using them to run certain reports and then deliver them into certain people's inboxes. You know, simple task happens all the time, uh, but because the task is completely repeatable month after month, you know, build a bot for it. Uh, and finally, you know, automated testing is something else that you might consider using a bot for. Um, you know, it'll, because it's scripted, you know, it's running the exact same test every single time. You could even have uh, pre-test results or, you know, expected results, and then do a quick validation check if the results from the test, you know, match what your expectations were. Um, a lot of other applications have much more robust uh, automated testing tools, but you could absolutely use, you know, RPA to do quick testing, um, to do uh, iterative testing, um, you know, regression testing, you know, for some of your applications. So we're going to look at a quick RPA example um, from UiPath. Uh, and I will warn you the, the first couple seconds, it's kind of a high pitched little uh, ringing. So just FYI. Hi, my name is Matt and I am an RPA developer. I'm currently automating the process of HR enrollment. Let me present to you the steps. The robot will receive information from my organization, such as code, SAP number, and email address. The robot will perform a search into the system and will return the name, position, and status for each one of them. This is what the process looks like in the studio. Bob has created a part of this process. Let's test the process and see how it works. The robot will search in the SAP environment for each personal number and will get the correct data for each one of them. Now my robot just finished and I'll be able to see the logs in the output pane. My manager came with a change request, so I need to redevelop this part and republish the process. To action this, I modified the process and I need to click Publish from the Setup tab in order to have the latest version on our server. My project was published successfully. Now I want to publish this to Orchestrator and schedule it to run every day at 7am. We need to search for the demo process. After the demo process has been found, we need to use the latest version of my process. Now the process is ready to run with the latest process. Now I need to click on new versions and I would be able to use the latest one, not the old version created by my colleague, Bob. As you can see here, our demo process has been scheduled correctly and ready to run every day at 7 a.m. according to my time zone. What I need to do next is to schedule this process. If I search for my process, it will appear, as you may see, as scheduled at 07 a.m. Thank you for watching. So uh, let's do another breakdown, kind of like we did for the, the chat bots. Um, so right away in the beginning, we kind of saw the, the demo process, right? We had data in Excel sheet. Uh, we had the bot interacting to pull that data out. Uh, there were some pre-saved credentials um, where the bot was able to log into the SAP application, post the data uh, kind of line by line, um, find the, the candidate information. Um, and the part we didn't quite see was where it was returning values to Excel and then saving. Um, but it did, I think you can see each uh, line by line performing multiple searches. So again, it's really just emulating the user experience. You know, it's clicks, it's pre-saved credentials, um, and it's kind of copying and pasting the data in. Um, then we kind of saw that scripting platform, right? That graphical uh, kind of box or flowchart based um, visualization of, of how the bot's built. And behind the scenes with, um, you know, with some of these tools, is really where the uh, the development and uh, storing variables and storing logic happens. Um, but at the highest level, 
you can use kind of those flow charts to, to mock up or um, kind of show your overall process end to end. And then thirdly, at the end, you know, we saw where that bot was published to orchestrator. Um, and I, you could see that there were hundreds, if not you know, thousands of bots. Um, and some of them had every five minutes as the schedule. Some of them had, you know, once a day at 7 a.m. Um, and you can also do the same thing with triggers, right? Um, so really, we kind of see the full use of a bot, uh, I think, pretty well in that quick little bit. So the last thing that I wanted to talk about um, before we kind of wrap up and then get into questions and things like that is optical character recognition. Because um, oftentimes when we're talking about automating processes, uh, digitizing processes, OCR gets brought up. Um, and so I think it's worth calling out and kind of comparing with chatbots and RPA uh, because it's just a little bit different. Um, so, you know, what is OCR? It's really converting documents or images to editable and searchable text. So the strength here is that it is very uh, cost effective and very time effective compared to human data entry. You know, um, OCR engines are getting very, very powerful, um, pulling text off a page and digitizing it, uh, as opposed to having a person read the text and type it. Um, you know, OCR will win nine times out of 10. Uh, the other strength is kind of an add-on to OCR itself, you know, not just the processing engine, but if you have a full OCR product, you can kind of classify and structure the output. So it's not just that it's uh, been digitized, it's that you can start to apply business logic, you can start to apply rules, um, and you can start to actually use that, uh, that digital text right away. One of the weaknesses of OCR is that it, um, if you're scanning like a, a paper image into a digital version, the efficacy really dependent, uh, depends on your scan um, or your image quality. You know, if you have a poor quality scan, a poor quality image, uh, even the best OCR engines are going to struggle. Um, and that's where you know a human would you know maybe be able to read or make it make out the whatever the text is. Um, additionally, downstream. Uh, you know, it does require additional processing. It requires business logic. It requires additional rules. It might require an RPA tool, or it might require human intervention to actually use the results. Like uh, turning an image or um, a, a paper form into something digital doesn't accomplish much on itself. It's kind of a piece of the overall puzzle. Uh, and that's really the difference between kind of chatbots and RPA and OCR is that it's very much use case specific with paper processes and image-based processes. Um, so it, it's definitely valuable if those are things that you're looking to automate, um, but it's nowhere near as universally flexible as RPA or a chatbot. So again, the structure here is that you have the engine itself, um, you know, where you have an image uploaded or captured, and then it's running uh, rules kind of in the background to, to digitize those. Um, you know, converting that image into editable and searchable text. Uh, at the back end, um, if you have a more developed product, if you have a more mature product, you can start to see some of these tools that allow structuring the output data. Um, you know, if you have a, a full-fledged OCR solution, you know, then you might start to see integrations, um, you know, integrating contracts into your CRM application, integrate invoices into your ERP application. Um, but really that depends on kind of what tool you have tacked onto the back end of the OCR. You know, the OCR is just the eyes. Um, you do kind of need a brain to transform that data. So let's think about use cases. Um, integrating a paper process or digitizing a paper process is the obvious one. Um, you know, if automating the entry of invoices, you know, I'll call out again, if you didn't see uh, KTEC's presentation earlier today, definitely a good one to check out. Um, but it doesn't even have to be just invoices. I mean, it could be contracts, it could be uh, text heavy documents. So capturing names and dates, um, you know, capturing receipt images, uh, you know, a lot of expense applications these days let you capture an image of your receipt, it'll OCR that image, um, and it'll kind of pre-populate an expense report. So again, you have the processing engine and then the business logic to format the output. Um, and then another use case to think about is data storage and archiving. Um, you know, if you have sender or receiver information, if you have data on physical forms, you know, make it 
searchable. Um, so you can actually access or use a lot of your historical paper documents. So I know that's uh, kind of a lot, right? We talked about chatbots, we talked about RPA, we talked about OCR. Um, and so let's think about these cases where uh, automation really makes sense. So RPA, I think, is fairly straightforward. It's easy to see where those, where those things make sense. You want it highly manual. You want it highly repetitive and rules-based, right? You don't want to have to, oh, excuse me, you don't want to have to code every single variation or exception. If you have readable electronic inputs, like the output from an OCR, um, that's definitely going to help RPA uh, because, again, it's working entirely within kind of the, the user desktop experience. So if you have data in Excel, if you have data in an ERP, that all lends itself to RPA. Uh, standard inputs kind of goes back to the rules-based process idea um, and a low exception rate, right? You don't want to have uh, every single exception captured uh, in, in programming. Um, instead, what might be helpful is to just have a single exception process, which is kick this transaction out and have a person handle it. If we think about chatbots, right? Um, I, I harped on it a little bit earlier, but the real push for chatbots is where you have a user interaction. So um, I think we saw it with uh, you know, the search where you have complex data, you might have casual users. Similarly, uh, if it's externally facing, um, if you have like a password reset, um, again, it's user interaction specifically, um, either to facilitate or accelerate um, an internal process or to fully automate uh, if it is something that can be done um, you know, completely repeatably. And then for OCR, you know, we just talked about this a second ago, but really it's about the paper processes, it's about image-based processes, it's about uh, even PDF, um, if it's not a searchable PDF, um, that you need full text, you need full uh, data. Um, and really, again, the idea with OCR is not just enough to make it digital, it's that you should be doing something with that data after the fact. Um, you know, interface it with another application. You know, for your invoice, send it to your ERP application. For your contract, uh, send it to your CRM application. So the last thing I want to leave you with uh, is really just uh, kind of harping on the message about um, applying the right tool for the right situation. So if you think about the scenario where, you know, you're recruiting candidates that apply both through an online portal or an in-person job fair, right? You're going to need a way to accept, digitize, and sort resume information from those job fairs. Um, you know, it's one thing to go to a job fair and say, well, find our website and apply online. Um, you know, there may still be a, a dual entry path, both digital information as well as paper information. So in terms of digitizing those resumes, OCR is the obvious solution, right? You want to turn those from paper into a full text, digitally consumable format. Now you have a digital format and what do you do with it? Um, if you have a template, if you have uh, like an applicant tracking system, if you have a database that you want to bring that information into, uh, RPA would be a good use or a good tool um, to just upload files, right? You save 50 different candidate resumes in a folder. You have your RPA bot looking at that folder and just going file by file, upload, 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 you know, create new record. Um, you know, a repeatable process, a digital process that is low value for a human operator. And then thirdly, if you think about, all right, now we have all of these candidates, we've parsed out all of their information, we know their skills, their experience, um, and now you want to start looking through that resume data, that's where you would consider implementing, you know, a chatbot. So you can do a traditional search, um, but if you have like a, a casual hiring manager, um, or if you know exactly what you're looking for, you know, you can use the chatbot to really parse through all of that data that you've, you've just digitized. Um, you know, again, it's the user interaction, in this case, from the hiring manager perspective. So a couple key takeaways, you know, just before we wrap up here, um, it's always important to define your processes first. Uh, you know, you want to select the right tool, um, and you're going to select the right tool by being thoughtful about 
you know, what am I actually trying to automate here? Um, also, like we saw in the previous example, you know, feel free to combine tools, you know, use the right tool for the right situation. Um, sometimes RPA is right. Sometimes a chatbot's right. Sometimes neither of them is right. And it's a complex task that should just be kept by a human operator. Um, the second point is really that automation and acceleration are both things to consider, um, but for slightly different reasons, right? Um, automation, again, full end-to-end -end straight through processing. Uh, but even if you can't achieve that because there's too much variability or there's a roadblock or you need a human approval, accelerating those manual steps for your staff um, are still going to be valuable. They're still going to save time, um, even if it is kind of a, a hybrid process at the end of the day. And then the third thing is really to realize your return on investment by separating out what's work, what work is best for a computer and what work is best for a human. Um, so I mentioned it in the beginning, but data entry versus data analysis. Um, you know, analysis is a human uh, strength. The data entry, definitely a bot strength. You know, rules-based transactions, you know, bot strength, open-ended work, get a thoughtful, well-trained staff member, you know, to do that kind of work. So I think that leaves us about five or 10 minutes here for Q&A. Um, and I did see a couple things coming through the chat. Give me one moment here. Yeah, it looks like we've got a couple here, Stephen. Um, also, shout out to Cynthia on the call who's wearing some of her Lear swag. We love to see that for the Strategy Summit. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, first question is, are these services that Alir currently offers to train or perform for companies? Uh, yes. Um, the, the biggest thing is the strategy side. So I think I made reference to it earlier. You know, I'm not a bot developer, um, but I think one of the hardest things for a lot of organizations in getting started is even deciding what makes sense to automate, what makes sense to, to put the time and the money into. Um, and I, that's really where I think a leader can, can shine and can, can help out your organizations is getting a framework around what your processes are, which ones are best suited to which task, um, and then you know what does the investment look like um, in terms of you know getting a bot developer, uh, getting a chat bot developer, um, you know implementing an OCR solution. So that's really where you know a lot of the strategy folks at Alir can can come in handy. Thanks, Stephen. And I know you mentioned it too, but um, our strategic partner K Tech also does a ton of work around. Um, RPA and chatbots as well. So that session will be linked in the um, session repository when it comes out. Another question that came through, what platform do you recommend for RPA? So I've actually seen a couple. Um, I've built bots myself in Automation Anywhere and UiPath. Um, I think UiPath is a little easier to use for kind of an, an end user um, if you're just a, a casual um, Kind of a casual developer. I'm, I'm not a developer. Automation Anywhere's interface was very much development focused. Um, and so just based on that, um, you know, I think that UiPath kind of wins for the casual user who's looking to explore it for the first time. Um, if you're an enterprise user and you um, are really looking for powerful development tools, you know, you can absolutely still do that in UiPath. You can definitely do it in Automation Anywhere. Um, but it kind of depends where you're coming from. Um, you know, a lot of these RPA tools are, they offer very similar types of features and functionality. So it does end up being, um, you know, is this going to be for all of your BAs? You know, are they using RPA? Because then it might make more sense to have a more of the graphical um, formatting. If it's all developers and you're setting up a bot development team, then I actually think it matters uh, a little bit less um, because most of these, um, most of the bot tools that are out there have pretty robust, you know, development support. Um, so I hate to waffle on it, uh, but it is kind of, it's kind of an, it depends answer. And it looks like we don't have any other questions in the chat right now. If you do think of anything, there is contact information on the last slide, or you are able to send any additional questions to strategy summit at alir.com. 
Um, just wrapping up the presentation today, thank you for everyone joining day one of the Strategy Summit. Um, we're so excited to have another full day of learning tomorrow, starting with maximizing the value of a project management office that is at 9 a.m. Central. And again, all links for tomorrow will be sent out um, in just a couple of minutes here to all attendees. As a reminder, all the recordings will be available next week and will be sent out to all active registrants, as well as um, the professional development units for PMI for those couple sessions will be sent out next week as well. Again, thank you to Stephen for presenting and everyone for joining us today. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. We'll see you in the morning.